Good morning and welcome to what is episode 49 of Roadcast. Um, they say a week is a long time in politics and uh, it's a week now since I recorded my previous Roadcast which covered a variety of subjects including the, um, the outbreak of riots across um, towns in largely in England but also in Ireland and uh, <clears throat> I posited that each and every one of those so-called riots is pretty much engineered uh, it's all in the playbook if you want further details of that go and listen to episode 48 but um, inevitably perhaps today's broadcast includes some more on the uh, manipulated unrest that is breaking out across Brit the British Isles right now and it's all demonstrably planned. One of the things that caught me eye this morning which I found uh, what would I say perhaps most dystopian or particularly Orwellian was a tweet put out by the Crown Prosecution Service the head of which used to be Keir Starmer, you know, he was director of public prosecutions when it was the, and he made the determination there was not enough evidence to um, to take Jimmy Savile to trial. The guy's a fixer, but he's also a particularly um, mendacious kind of character. Uh, I'm beginning to doubt whether there's anything genuine about him at all other than his mendacity. That is genuine. He is a... I don't want to get bogged down on this, but he is a particularly odious character. Anyway, um, in lockstep with the recent diktats from Herr Kia, we have this um, tweet from the CPS. Think before you post. Content that incites violence or hatred isn't just harmful, it can be illegal. The CPS takes online violence seriously and will prosecute when the legal test is met. Now, I would argue that that is just empty rhetoric because there is nothing to substantiate it. If we take the trivium, which simply means the three means the three ways where we have the data we have the logic and reason and the outcome is the rhetoric we can see that this statement from the CPS contains very little grammar very little data and the reasoning is woeful hence the statement sounds exactly what it is fallacious there is no reason, logic, or indeed any real data behind it. And let's take, for instance, the... Um, I mean, that, that, that tweet is about online harm. So if it's in with the online harm safety bill, or whatever it's called, OK, this notion that people can somehow experience harm, which, of course, is loss or injury, whilst reading or listening to something or viewing something on social media. Upon close scrutiny, it falls apart as being the bullshit that it is. But we are living in cloud cuckoo world right now. And, you know, I've been saying for, for many years now that the CPS is not fit for purpose. Um, unless the purpose is, is of course, to, to, to cover up uh, <coughs> state-sponsored uh, criminality. Um, and why wouldn't it be? It was obviously very good at that when Keir Starmer was at the helm. And um, what's changed? Fuck all. It's all some kind of Freemasonic, Talmudic, internationally Jewish veil of inversion, perversion and distortion of the truth. So 
today, oh, I haven't even said where I am. I am near Moor Green Reservoir, which is adjacent to um, Beauvale, Valley, Beauvale Abbey, the ruins of Beauvale Abbey, which we may see, we may see later on in this ramble. Um, <clears throat> but it's close to, it's, it's, it's close to Underwood in uh, Nottinghamshire, so I'm back, out, I'm still in the Shire. And once again, I'm in some lovely woodland. Far, far away from the madding crowd. Or should I say the madding crowds. Um, so to go back to this, this question of rhetoric, it's like so, so many pronouncements that are made by the propagandists via the usual mainstream media outlets the BBC perhaps being the most obvious and, um, and worst offender when it comes to pumping out <coughs> propaganda that has no basis in, in logic or reason. And in fact, the rhetoric, the use, the use of the language is very interesting because the whole notion of online harm Is, is potentially a, is potentially a spurious one. Well, it is, I think it is a spurious one. But the the most glaring aspect of, of the last week or so, what we're looking at, is is this. I mean, the whole world, as I've said before, is a, is a vast game of hide and seek. Things are hidden. Things are sought for. People are hiding things. People are seeking things, and that leads to exclusions. You know, when something inconvenient doesn't fit the the required dictax of the fake narrative that's being spun out, <coughs> then that fact is ignored, or it's it's simply hidden. So, for instance, Keir Starmer, or Keir Starling, as perhaps he would prefer to be called, has make, been making various pronouncements, along with all the usual lickspittles, about far-right, people of the far-right across the British Isles who are rising up in response to, these, um, to the mass immigration and to the enforcement of that policy on the people to their, to their detriment. Causing them harm and causing their communities harm and loss. Okay, so Keir Starmer comes out with a statement saying he's um, he's going to protect the Muslim communities. And lo and behold, we see the two-tier policing going on, whereby young Islamic those young young lads of the Islamic faith are actually out on the streets in Birmingham and elsewhere with fucking machetes with knives, openly carrying them. And what did the police do about this? Fuck all. They'd been told to stand back and to tread softly when it comes to um, members of the Islamic faith. But all the while, they're fueling this nonsense about there being a far right, a coordinated, organized, political far right. And it doesn't exist. Most of the people, and there have been a few who have been arrested over the last week, most of the blokes are demonstrably not connected to any organisation. Rather than being far right, they are just concerned members of their communities who are standing up and asking questions and challenging the imposition of all this bullshit upon them. And, you know, there was a, uh, allegedly, a Christian statue of the Virgin Mary was, uh, was smashed by Islamicists, Islamicists. Uh, but there's no mention of that. So that, you know, that's excluded. That's excluded from the mainstream. The genuine concerns of the individuals who the mainstream media and Stammer would have you believe are advocates of National Socialism and, uh, you know, maybe closet fans of Adolf Hitler is, is just epic nonsense. These are genuine people who've got concerns about what the fuck's going on. 
And I don't remember any attempt being made to protect women and, and girls in these towns like Rochdale, Telford, Rotherham, Huddersfield, etc., where we've we've witnessed the rise of these these grooming gangs, which have been and that is spanning decades. So Keir Starmer and the rest of his cronies simply try and ignore that. It never comes up. It's never an issue. Oh, hold, whereas you know, if we were really applying logic to the situation, we've got this data. The data says that hundreds, if not thousands of white British girls across Britain have been targeted by Pakistani Muslim men, largely, but also men of other, uh, from other countries. And that the, the um, and every, everyone's treading very softly around that, as if it's not going on. Whereas as soon as, uh, you know, there's a bit of rumpus, so there's a bit of a ruckus kicking off somewhere, and uh, you know, lo and behold, someone's complaining about mass immigration or the housing of uh, fighting age men in a commandeered hotel near to their community. Those people who've got genuine concerns are immediately labelled far right. And it's the lack of intellectual vigour behind all of this, intellectual vigour or intellect and intellectual rigour behind all of this that I find astonishing. I mean, they say that a country, the people get the politicians that it deserves. But I don't think anyone uh, realistically has deserved what is being imposed upon us by the WF, WEF, the Rothschild Front, which is, of course, Agent Starmer, Agent Starmer of the WEF. And. His mendacity is plain to see. <coughs> he lies glibly. He has no problem with lying. And to get back to these things, he has no problem with excluding things. You know, he'll exclude data or evidence that would uh, suggest that, that Jimmy Savile was... Um, there was enough evidence to try Jimmy Savile for his crimes back in 2010, I believe it was, when he was head of the CPS. He'll exclude all that. Uh, just as he will exclude any discussion of the, the grievances, the genuine grievances that the people demonstrably have. Whereas if you were of an ethnic uh, persuasion, right, the state would be bending over backwards and to, to get you to express your grievances. Largely directing it, of course, into, into wanting you to express, oh, how racist... Uh, this country is. And so consequently, it all comes across as insane. Because it's not backed up by the facts of the matter. It's not backed up by the data, <clears throat> by logic and reason. It's just cunt waffle that's being spouted out and, you know, huge groups of people being labelled. And, you know, Starmer says that people will be arrested if they take part in these... Uh, in the riots and they cause damage or to cause harm and loss and some men have been have been arrested and hauled before the magistrates the one i was thinking of the one that springs to mind i was reading about on the bbc website yesterday was a man called uh, am i wrong but it's, i think it's, i think his name is rogers christopher rogers and uh, he's charged with, uh, I can't remember, it's, it's charged with a fray, but anyway, the allegation is that he got in the way of the police and uh, there was a bit of pushing and shoving. It was, it's nothing, really, in, in terms of what, compared to what's really been going on. And uh, the judge asked him, how did he plead? And he said, uh, not guilty, my love. He's from Barnsley, and if you don't know it, men and women will call you love uh, regardless of your sex. So I did find that quite funny. But nevertheless, the de deputy district judge, who, you know, is an underling, he's a pen pusher, he's got no fucking power at all, really. 
determined that he should be, uh, this individual should be held in custody until August the 20th. Whereas people who are out there of an Islamic persuasion, brandishing fucking machetes, behaving in um, in violent ways, are, um, are, are, are dealt with very lightly. I mean, even the head stamping incident in at Manchester Airport, it seems to, from what I can gather, the two individuals who attacked, who demonstrably attacked the police, are not to be prosecuted. How the fuck does that work? So we've got British males who have been placed on remand for simply standing up for their communities, for expressing their grievances, and not really, from what I could see, causing any major rumpus, you know, they were being sent down. One of them got sentences, sentenced to 20, 26 months for basically getting in the face of the coppers and um, I don't know whether he was ranting at them or there was a bit of push, there was a bit of push, again a bit of a ruckus, a bit of pushing and shoving going on. He's, got, he's 53 years old and he's been given 26 months. Whereas there's a young immigrant, 21 year old immigrant, who was found guilty of uh, sexual assault on three different young lasses up in Newcastle. And he, he got a suspended sentence or something. So, you know, when people are talking about two tier, is it two? Karma, two tier. Karma, <laughs> two tier starma, or two tier policing. Um, it's never discussed in the mainstream media, but it's actually a fact that's in your face that you can't ignore. And so this constant kowtowing to a, an immigrant population of Mohammedans, many of whom are, are, are interbred, according to um, you know, official statistics on this, that's not me making it up, it's, it, the, the statistic as I posited last week suggested that 70% of British uh, Pakistanis are inbred. And I can remember when I was working at a school in Leicester, which was back in the 80s and 90s, and that late 80s and the 90s, and that was predominantly um, a catchment area Muslim kids. And it was common amongst themselves to refer to, oh, so-and-so, she's my cousin's sister, or he's my cousin brother, meaning that it's their dad's or their mother's sister or brother <coughs> who's had a child who has, who has become married, uh, who, who they are marrying. They're marrying the first cousins, in other words. I don't know if that came across very clear. And, you know, people being banged up um, being put in a cage and arrest, being arrested, put in a cage for simply making a comment on Twitter, which is immediately and falsely labelled as far right. Because the point is, there's no underlying ideology that these people are following, so how can you call them far right? They're just ordinary blokes. But of course, the, the weakness in the system lies in this illogicality and its use and, and re complete reliance upon um, on logical fallacies. I mean, when it boils down to it, as I've said before, the law must provide remedy. And in the case of these men that have been um, detained, and I would argue pretty much unlawfully detained, and charged with an assortment of bogus crimes in which no one got hurt, uh, you know, for there to be a crime there has to be a victim. And from what I can gather, pushing and shoving on the front line against a uh, police force who are actively working as agents for the WEF, whether or not they know it, in their unquestioning support and allegiance to the immigrant population at the expense of the native Britons. <coughs> Pushing back against all that is not a crime. Remember, in conscience, if you have the genuinely held belief that your actions are necessary in order to prevent a crime from taking place, then this fuck all, 
the legal system or the justice system can do about that. But from that, I would imagine if um, these ridiculous sentences were appealed, they would all be uh, they would all be struck out. I think they'd be successful. As ever, all you can do is is speak the truth. And um, speak the truth to power is an expression that comes to mind. So the antidote to Keir Starling's lies and exclusions is to simply continue to do what he doesn't want you to do, which is pump out the truth. Release all those memes. Lampoon these fools. Satirise them to the maximum. Show them to be exactly what they are. Blundering puppets. Dunderheads who are playing a very, very dangerous game on the simple basis that their rhetoric is empty. They've got nothing to back it up. It is like the, the scenario with the Emperor's new clothes, quite literally. Although, maybe it's not a good idea to think of Keir Stalin in the nude. Now, on another note, I have a, uh, I've ordered, I ordered a copy of David Icke's book, The Answer, which I believe was uh, released recently, 2021, 2022. And uh, I thought, well, I've read, some David, I've read some David Icke books in the past. And, you know, when I first read David Icke, which was in the early 2000s, my attitude was, well, I don't know if there are these shape-shifting reptilian creatures walking amongst us, you know, let alone within the, uh, within the Saxco and the Goatee family. However, um, I, did take the, I did take the line that I hoped it was true because it made the world so much more interesting and exciting. So I thought, I'll go and look at, I'll, I'll order this book from the library. It's taken a few months to come through. And um, it's published by his media company, Iconic. And as always, it is very interesting. It's nearly, it's about 600 pages long. But I do question his, um, his view. And I wonder exactly what his intention is with him continuing to pump out this view that um, we are controlled by non-human entities in the shape of these uh, bloodlines, which he argues are effectively aliens that um, have infiltrated mankind and are actually going around in the avatars of mankind. But historically, there's no evidence for this at all. It's all... I just wonder if it's an adult fairy story, uh, which, which would go hand in hand with the whole science fiction uh, paradigms. No, which have been thrust down the fe into the faces and down the throats and into the brains of everyone for the last 70 or 80 years. You know, Star, Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, Doctor Who, Space 1999. When really we're looking, it's all a distraction and really we shouldn't be looking up to what may, as far as I'm concerned, is a holographic construct. But looking down to what is underneath our feet, to the, uh, the inner world. And this is another exclusion that people, um, you know, so-called scientists, historians, and the rest of them, would exclude, do exclude, these inconvenient narratives that relate, um, <coughs> relate tales of, um, of an underground, um, world that is beneath our feet. The stories of Agatha, there was the story of the um, of the man who went with his son and sailed right up to the Arctic and there they found an entrance to the inner world. There are the uh, suppressed accounts by Admiral Byrd of what he saw in Antarctica about the discovery, or as he put it, the immense uh, volume of new lands of territory that was existent in the Antarctic. 
I don't know. No, I don't know whether his account of meeting these beings that were living uh, in these deep underground um, cities was was. Uh, I don't know right now whether that was was true or whether it's been put out there as, as misinformation. But the point is, all these accounts of an inner world have been uh, excluded from the mainstream narrative. Because why, they, why are the exclusions? Because they don't fit the narrative. The narrative requires you to believe that you are simply um, an accident, born from a big bang, that's wandering aimlessly on this planet, which is drifting aimlessly, spinning aimlessly at great speed through a vast universe. Which is a, a rather nihilistic uh, concept. Well, and of, of course, is this proves any notion of God? David Icke will probably. I, I'll, I might do a review of the book when I've finished it. <clears throat> but the question is, would David Icke? Um, well, some are saying David Icke is pumping out a new age uh, construct, which is to do with the theosophy uh, religion. Um, continuing the, the work of the Lucifer Trust and uh, Madame Blavatsky. And, uh, you know, some would, would say, well, it's the work of Alice Crowley, it's, it's the work of the Demiurge. Um, and I do wonder, you know, why David Icke steadfastly stuck to that narrative when, in fact, there is very little for... There's, there's very little evidence to substantiate it. If the law has no regard for um, for evidence, for data, for logic and reason, if it's all about putting its rhetoric before those aspects, then the law, the legal system, which the legal system clearly does, then that system is clearly and manifestly not fit for purpose. And, you know, I was, I was rather heartened, if heartened is the correct word, this week by um, an account which I read by Ian Davis, I'll put the link up to it, uh, who had attended the, I think it was the four days of trial that Richard D. Hall went through, in his harassment case, which was brought by a man called Hibbert. This Mr. Hibbert claimed that he and his daughter had been, um, had experienced life-threatening, uh, life-changing injuries whilst they were in attendance at the Mariara Grande concert back in, uh, was it 2017? The incident at the, where, whereby the, the the claim was that a bomb had gone off and that um, a number of people had been injured. But upon looking at the evidence, and there was something like 800 photographs, still images, from the, the scene of the, of the alleged bombing, the crime scene, as Richard D. Hall calls it, not one of those 800 pictures contained an image of this Mr. Hibbert and his daughter. And um, as I read through the, the court report by Ian Davis, which was very good, it became manifestly clear that even the two barristers, one called Mr Oakley, I, I believe, the one who was representing Richard Hall, um, it all come, the, the whole notion, to have, the whole idea of, having, of suppressing his material, not being able to reference to his, uh, make any reference to his, his book, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, um, was preposterous. And in the end, uh, of course, they had to relent and it, it, it was unavoidable that he was unable, that he, it was unavoidable when he was being uh, cross-examined that they could not reference his, um, his book and the judge, of course, allowed it. So what, what came out of that was um, essentially that this Mr. Hibbert character was a bit of a fantasist who had already put out uh, information pertaining to his daughter. So basically he was saying Richard D. Hall had harassed him, caused him and his family distress. It turned out that the co-claimant was his daughter who was acting through the uh, power of attorney given to his wife, his ex-wife, who knew fuck all about the, ca the case. It was manifest under cross-examination. She had no idea about it. She didn't know that Mr. Hibbert had even brought it. And 
and uh, the allegation, of course, backfired because they were saying that Richard D. Hall had harassed them and caused them harm, distress, all this bullshit. When in fact, all the publicity had been generated by the BBC hit piece on Richard D. Hall, which was a panorama documentary, um, largely cobbled together with the uh, <clears throat> by the notorious. Mariana Spring. The harassment case. Even the uh, the barristers agreed that he shouldn't have been. He shouldn't have even gone into the high court. So what the fuck was it doing there? I would argue that this was all done at the behest of the BBC and Mariana Spring, who was, if anyone was out there harassing anyone, it was Mariana Spring when she turned up at, uh, in Merthyr Tydville and started haranguing Richard D. Hall at his market stall. But he had refused to have anything to do with her, and he'd refused to have anything to do with the Panorama uh, programme, which was some hit piece on, on him and uh, the world of, of conspiracy. But interestingly, they had changed... Previously, they'd been referencing, uh, wrongly, as it turned out, been referencing Richard D. Hall as a chicken farmer, the son of a chicken farmer. And now they're describing him as a, uh, in the mainstream media, as a former TV producer. Make of that what you will, but I think it's interesting. Anyway, to get back to the case, Richard D. Hall obviously played a blinder when it came to being cross-examined. Uh, he was the... Um, he was cross-examined as a witness. And his performance was in sharp contrast to that of Mr. Hibbert and his uh, his ex-wife, who were basically uh, who basically could come across as uh, as, a, as a pair of fuckwits, with Mr. Hibbert as a particularly manipulative and special kind of fuckwit. Now, if you read it, you will see quite clearly that if we apply logic and reason to the facts as they're presented in the court, then the only outcome would be that the case was dismissed and that Richard D. Hall was completely exonerated on the charge of him being... Uh, on the charge of him causing harassment. So I do have to say that, you know, even though all of this is part of a playbook, and it's manifestly engineered, and it's all about creating conflict between people as a way of, of, um, of controlling them, the old divide and rule. If you've got truth and facts on your side, then there is a tendency for all their nonsense to fall apart, because it's not supported by anything. The, the rhetoric is empty, not being supported by any facts, by any data, and... Uh, there is no reason behind it. There's no, it's ill-founded. And if something that's ill-founded, you could argue that it's a void. And something that is void is just simply going to collapse in upon itself. And so I wonder whether the same will happen to, to Keir Starmer. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men are doomed uh, to fail. But Keir Starmer seems to, seems to be rather disturbingly um, cut from the, the same cloth as, a, um, as any communist kind of dictator, only with a plummy uh, estuary English accent. Another fact that came out which I thought was interesting this week was the, um, was the data showing that more people have been arrested in Britain for um, <clears throat> making, uh, you know, naughty social media posts than in any other country around the world per head of the population. There was something like 2,400 people that had been arrested for making uh, posts on, on Facebook or, yeah, I think it was on Facebook. So people are getting stuck in cages for making comments on social media platforms. And all the while, Starmer's wanting to roll out his, uh, his digital wet dream. 
facial re more facial recognition cameras and a digital ID, which is, which the aim is to have you um, provide government issued ID in order to get onto the internet. Make of that what you will. So it's crazy and it's illogical. And the courts are clearly a captured operation, as, as just as the as the government is. But the point I'm trying to make, in spite of all of that, all of that tyranny and um, cunt waffle, because that's what it is. Remember, empty, empty rhetoric is just a, is just cunt waffle, really. It's something somebody says that's not backed up by the facts and uh, has no real reason reasoning behind it. I think it has a tendency to all fall apart when when faced with, with the facts and the truth of the matter and when, and when faced with individuals like Richard D. Hall who just don't, don't fucking back down. If Richard D. Hall is not exonerated as a consequence of, of, from what I read, of the summation of the trial and the witness testimony that was presented to the court, if he's not exonerated as a consequence of that, then he's got an immediate ground for appeal. Because any right-thinking individual would read that through, and I dare say it'll show up in the, in the transcript as well, and they would conclude that um, the entire claim was ill-founded, that it was preposterous, and it was brought for, for reasons that um, had more to do with silencing Richard D. Hall than, uh, <clears throat> than, than providing any, any award to, to someone who had genuinely been uh, injured, harmed and injured by Richard Hall's behaviour, which, you know, the elements of harassment that were not, the, the, the elements of a harassment ca case were not there. You know, the repeated behaviour, the doxing of someone's private information. In a letter before claim, which they sent to Richard, right, this is the letter you send before you're about to, I, I mean, as it sounds, it's the letter before you make the claim in the court. Um, he replied by offering and he didn't have to do this, to take down the references and any images relating to, to Mr Hibbert and his daughter, who it turns out has, has got a reading age of nine for some reason. She's obviously um, mentally, mentally challenged. Can I say retarded? Of course I fucking can. Especially after the last uh, podcast, you know, because in and amongst all of this, we've got levels of retardation that are off the scale. So it's like a big soup that's been... Uh, been stirred up, but it's not a soup of the best ingredients. No, no, just the opposite. It's a bowl of um, nutritionless gruel that Starmer thinks we all ought to swallow. So there is always hope, and as I've said, <coughs> as I said. Um, after the last uh, broadcast a week ago, these times call for clear minds and stout hearts, for stoicism, for that ability to, to tough it out, to laugh it off for what it is, and to simply stand proud and true under the facts of the matter. Don't give in to the bullshit. Stand your ground and see what happens. And as I was, I've said this before. If you stand your ground, the the construct will will respond to that, and things will work in your favour. As seems to be the case here with with Richard D. Hall. He stood his ground. He's expressed the truth, and in so doing, he's exposed the lies and distortions of the claimants in this matter. For when it boils down to it, there was no harassment. And as I say, the only individual, and she's a government lackey, guilty of harassment as far as I can see, is, uh, is Miss Marianne Spring. Anyway, this has been episode 49 of the roadcast and if you've got this far I do thank you for watching and uh, I would also ask you if you have uh, if you have a, if you have enjoyed it please consider making a donation 
uh, buy me a few copies at the bottom of your website. And if you haven't subscribed uh, yet, please do so. The website is roguemail.org. If you subscribe to my emails, you will get notifications of every post uh, that I that I'll publish. Until the next time, a fun farewell to one and all. And I'll catch you on the flip side. Cheers.